Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I am joined by Menno Henselmans. It's been a while, Menno. Uh, it's really good to have you back. Uh, how are things Pleasure. going on your end? You've been, how, how many different countries have you been in the last six months? Uh, well, not as many as usual because of yeah, uh, the whole uh, <laughs> pandemic thing, uh, but still uh, a couple. We got stuck in the US, um, our visa waivers expired, um, and then we went to Sweden. So I've now been here three months or so, so only two. And um, yeah, Sweden is open and uh, yeah. it's a stable life, which was a very welcome change. But um, I know that uh, your uh, subscribers also know uh, Mike Isfertel. So I was actually neighbors with Mike Isfertel last, uh, or before the ne- last two months, the three months or so before that. Uh, and that was awesome. So uh, at least something good came out of the whole thing. Yeah, that is good. And yeah, I mean, I had a couple of clients in Sweden and I know they haven't shut down the entire time. So it's probably mm. a night, it's a smart place to go and move to. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, completely open. Even the things like when people say, yeah, they have natural social, social distancing. It's like, <laughs> I meet probably a hundred people a day just to get to the gym and then I have to <laughs> wait for equipment in the gym. Uh, I walk through a crowded library on the way to the gym because it's, it's the same building. So yeah, there's, I mean, there is, there are regular guidelines, but uh, it's if you didn't know Corona existed and you were planted in Sweden right now, you would not know. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Well, today we wanted to talk about genetics uh, because I, I was saying to Menno, it's, it's come up many times on the podcast, but I don't think it has kind of been a dedicated episode that's really gone into genetics surrounding kind of physique endeavors because I think it's important to obviously, I think people listening to this are going to expect that, but it's important to know mm-hmm. that genetics impact a lot of things and i guess a lot of things actually impact physique endeavors but um yeah that's what i want to kind of go into with depth in depth with menno and i know you've spoken about it on various podcasts and you've got kind of articles referencing it so i think you'd be a, a great resource to talk about it and i actually wanted to start off with something that maybe um people aren't expecting and kind of kick off with something interesting was like is there any common uh, misconceptions around genetics that you find like especially obviously surrounding physique sports um, I think one of the biggest ones probably is uh, heart gainers. Like there's a common ID of uh, the authors of, I think, Braun, which was a very popular series, and um, a, c- a couple of other lines of uh, people that have the idea that heart gainers should do low volume. And there's actually a substantial literature now that uh, indicates people that are not responsive to a certain training program, like non-responders, they're called. They, they're not responders to that program, but they probably need a greater stimulus. And there's also definitely some research indicating some people need a lower stimulus, like less stress. But most research finds that people that don't respond, they do respond if you just up the volume. So they just have a higher threshold. They need more of a stimulus, more of a stress to get the body adaptation processes going, basically. And for a lot of people, that means that if you're, like, if you're doing low volume and you're not making any gains, then probably... Uh, your first step of experimentation should be increased volume, not to, to stick with like low volume, because uh, that's where a lot of people I think just get stuck like right. in the idea that they're not making good progress, so you need low volume, and then they stick with low volume, and therefore they're not making good progress, and then you just flatlined. Yeah, I think it, it's one of those things where the average program out there is based around the average individual. So if you go and do that and it's mm-hmm. you're not really seeing gains, a lot of people will think, I, I don't know if you if it's too much for you, for some people or the other way, it's easy. You're just mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, it's obvious it's too too much. But I think for some people they might think are oh, like they don't think to do more. It's not nor- normally kind of something. I mean, maybe now as more information is coming out about volume, they'll start doing that. So no, very interesting because I think, yeah, a lot of people think hard gainers and low volume mm. tends to go hand in hand. So yeah, great. I, I think the question I wanted to open up with after that uh, was kind of the fact that obviously we're ultimately very, very similar in our genetic makeup, but kind of what role does genetics play then uh, if like people think oh we're like 99.9 percent similar kind of how mm-hmm. much of a role can genetics really play and maybe i don't know if you can put a percentage to it or you can compare it to like high quality nutrition high quality training sleep that sort of thing where where does genetics like lay in kind of comparison to everything else yeah we can actually there are two ways to put a percentage on it um the the first uh, or the second one like discusses heritability studies 
Uh, and the first is uh, uh, literal genetic makeup. And then if you look at that, like literally looking at how similar are our DNAs, then they are exceedingly similar, but that provides a very deceptive uh, or deceiving idea of how similar we are. Because if you look at like a Bonomo, uh, Bonomo monkey uh, or a chimp, they are also exceedingly similar. And in fact, even if you look at like a ringworm, uh, they're quite similar. And that, that makes sense in the sense that many of the little things we care about are like the fine tuning of the fine tuning in terms of how our bodies work. You know, like how do you respond to a higher versus lower resistance training stimulus? If you compare that to things like how does vision work? Yeah. Or how does how do our metabolic processes work? You know, the, the, the idea that we uh, have a species with male and female gender, for example, those things, those are very big primal features, emotional regulation, those things, you know, those are like the big picture things, genetically speaking. So, you know, the, the fact that we're like 99.99% similar, even that would be, um, could mean that there are actually profound differences in how we respond to exercise and nutrition. So I think the heritability studies are a better way to, to get an idea of, you know, percentage wise, how much do our genetics matter relative to other things. And it seems, uh, I've been a couple reviews on this and a meta-analysis not too long ago. It looks at across the whole population, it's about 50%. Uh, if you look at like how strong is someone, it appears to be about 50% genetics versus 50% everything other than genetics. Now that seems somewhat high, but it's actually not if you consider that that's the other 50% is like everything. So this is like mostly untrained individuals, like many recreational athletes and stuff, but very few bodybuilders, you know, because the sample, this is like whole population type uh, samples. So if you compare, um, if you only get 50% even in the strength levels between, you know, just two random persons off the street, and you compare them with like bodybuilders or powerlifters, and you see there is a huge difference between those. So that means that when you're comparing that, then the, it would be way, way below 50%. So if you're comparing people that already do strength training, then you're getting to the range where you know, compared to untrained individuals, it's by far how much exercise and everything we do. And I think that's also something most PTs can readily attest to. Like almost anyone can make progress. Like basically yeah. any, anyone really can get lean uh, or 100% everyone can get lean. Everyone can get stronger. Some people have a hard time building muscle, but there's, they can always build some. And I found for a lot of people, it just comes slower, but the end result is actually not too dissimilar. Um, so yeah, it, you know, percentage wise, uh, below 50%, we can say for sure, we can't say like an exact number, but uh, it's clear that well, basically everyone can profoundly change their physique, strength level, body fat percentage. I really like that. I like starting on a, a positive because like uh, people often, I think, I don't know, people that seek out topics like this, they're almost looking for like a confirmation that they are never going to be right. as jacked as what they should yeah, be. They look at like the extreme cases of Ronnie Coleman yeah. and uh, Andy Bolton. Those are like famous cases where uh, I think Andy Bolton was like, he squatted 300 or even 400. I think it was 300 pounds uh, and benched something similar like the first time he tried it. And Ridiculous. It was like, you know, lads at the gym thought I lifted before, but no. Like, <laughs> yeah, that may be because, you know, you were as strong to start with as some people get after 10 years of lifting. Maybe that has something to do with it, you know. Uh, but that's like, you know, the genetic freak, the, the point point zero 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 one yeah. percent of the population that ends up, you know, being competitive at the world level. And that's the question, actually. You kind of talked about how um, some people potentially like you end up at the same point even somewhere might get someone might get there sooner than you but you might just trickle on over a period of time and kind of the mm -hmm. question i was wanting to ask was how do you know how good your genetic genetics are do you is there like a certain length of time you can be kind of nailing your nutrition and training and know kind of uh, after a year if i've gained this much then yeah i'm this way inclined or is it a case of like you need more time to actually let these things come to kind of fruition mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you get some idea generally, um, but the problem is always that you only know how you reacted to what you did. So the fact that you, even like after a year of doing everything right by like what the average population should do, you know, like you have volume at like 15 sets per muscle group per week or something, you have protein intake at 1.8 grams, those kind of things. And you think like 
this is what it should be and I'm not responding, so my genetics suck. But it may just mean you need you know, 25 cells per muscle group or maybe you know, 10 or five. That's also possible, but less, less probable. So uh, that, that's, that's always very tricky. Uh, but overall, if you, you, you can get some idea, especially if someone trains hard with high efforts, because that's, that's a huge factor as well I see in a lot of people. And then it, uh, as you say, like, it's, it feeds on itself. Like if you have poor results uh, with effort that's maybe not 100% all the time, and that makes you even less motivated, and therefore you give even less effort, and like I say, you don't try higher volumes and those kind of things, then um, you know, it's, it's still fulfilling in a part. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, it's, I guess the question I had a following that was, um, and we almost answered it in that, can you become elite without kind of having good genetics? Can someone just right. work uh, and find what works for them and do it for a long period of time? And can they get to that top level if they don't have those pristine uh, genetics that like, I don't know, Andy Bolton or someone has? Right. So there are, um, there are some indicators you can use to, to see if you, you're likely to become elite. Uh, and frame size is probably the biggest one. Like I have a calculator on my website that uh, builds on like the best work we have on this, so fat free mass index, looks at like your, especially wrist and ankle size, which is an indicator of how big your bone structure is. And quite simply put, your bone structure is like, um, uh, it, it's your frame, it's like the, um, uh, your wardrobe, or how do you say this, what you put clothes on, like a clothing hanger, yeah. or a, there's a word for it, like a thing that you stand up, you put clothes over a it. A clothes whatever. horse, or I don't know. I'm not uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, something, you know, like, uh, it's like, like a wardrobe or a closet. Okay, if you right. have a bigger frame, you can, you can put more uh, clothes or in our case, muscle mass around it. Like if you have a very small frame, like you have very small hands, there's, you know, that's just the limit. Uh, especially for things like grip size, just the size of your hands is like a, a really big limiting factor. Like you, you can have the super strong muscles, but if the, your hands just aren't that big, then, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be the world's best power lifter or strong man, especially. So... Your, your frame size is a big, a big factor that's like significant across many things. And then there are a few things like uh, androgenic traits that have like, like weak correlations. Um, but you generally do see like if you look at the elite, and part of this is sterilization from androgenic steroid usage, you do see that they are all like square jaw, um, big frame size, they look masculine. You know, you, you basically never see uh, an elite athlete. Uh, in almost any kind of sport that's like remotely related to strength, that looks like uh, you look at them are like, oh yeah, is that a is that a guy or a girl? You know. So even aside from muscle mass, so they like elite athletes are typically masculine, um, and it, this goes for both genders. Like the uh, women also typically look slightly more yeah. um, masculine, like still possibly female, um, but you know more on the because it's a spectrum, you know, for both genders. And uh, you'd actually be surprised in research how difficult it can be to tell um, a person's gender if you strip away uh, all makeup and hair, especially. Like they've done experiments like that, and it's wow. the, you can do certain in psychological research. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, it's super, it's surprisingly hard because you, you think like, of course you can you can always yeah. tell. Like there's even borderline cases are always like you kind of know, but uh, but no, if, especially if you strip away the hair and, and makeup and things that we culturally do to make ourselves more masculine or um, or feminine. Uh, no, it's actually, uh, can be pretty hard. Um, but in any case, um, there are some quirky ones too, like your 2D40 ratio, which is the ratio of the uh, size of your uh, fingers. Um, and it basically means that if your, your ring finger is really long compared to um, your index finger, the, that's funny enough, one of those stranger than uh, fiction things. It's correlated uh, pretty strongly with prenatal testosterone exposure. So you got a lot of testosterone influx in the womb. And that correlates, you know, it's, it's, it's like a few percent variance of explanatory power, but it correlates with uh, sumo wrestling success, general uh, aggressiveness, sports um, athletic ability. Um, uh, Wikipedia actually has a super good overview on it. Uh, even things like the uh, chance of being homosexual and the chance of if you are homosexual, um, especially for, I think, women, if you are more butcher femme, as okay. it's called. <laughs> so... You know, this is definitely like not if you have like long ring fingers, you're you're gonna be like uh, you're a lesbian and you're in your boots, you know. But uh, it's like if you get a thousand people, like you have some idea of discriminating uh, between who's who. So uh, that, that's really uh, interesting, I think. Like super 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 quirky. Like why would that? Yeah. Be? Uh, but it's just nature. Sometimes uh, you get correlations like that that actually are robust. Um, other than that, yeah, it's 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 mostly a matter of experimentation. 
Like you, you, you have some ID, but you have people like Dorian Yates, you know, who was, didn't look like much when he started, um, but, you know, became one of the most famous bodybuilders of all time. Part of that's, of course, response to drugs. But um, I've heard that he was also really strong already, uh, like quite early in his training before he started using gear. Uh, so, yeah, some, some people you don't, you don't think they just don't look like it. Um, but there, there's still the chance you, you can get to the elite level. But generally speaking, um, the elites, they, the actual elites, like if you're going to set world records, you, you know pretty so. Yeah. That's really interesting because I think, I mean, when I'm thinking about bodybuilders, when I think about, I mean, good bodybuilding genetics is a bit different to just good muscle building genetics because like having small wrists, sure. small ankles, good muscle bellies, they all are super important for good bodybuilding but not necessarily like the small ankles and small kind of wrists and things like that don't necessarily lead to um kind yeah. of most muscle growth so i think potentially i, I guess I, I theorize i don't know if what you think menno some guys who do well early in their bodybuilding career could be those who have that type whereas someone mm. who has like big thick joints and everything they might not do so well early in their career but like later down the line when they've actually seen through their genetics in a sense their potential they might be much better down the line i don't know if that does that, does that make sense? Yeah, you, you see some of those things. Uh, I think the, the biggest sort of trend I see is that um, the people that have it genetically easiest uh, actually work the, uh, the least hard. And this is like one of those things where a lot of, if you look at like top athletes, and I think bodybuilders are generally the exception because you have to be so disciplined to be a high level bodybuilder. Um, and powerlifting and, and strongman, not as much as bodybuilding because of the diet factor, but still pretty, pretty uh, disciplined and hardcore compared to, say, soccer. Um, like, if you look at top soccer players, not, not, not hating on soccer uh, per se, but if you look at the level of in considering how much money is involved, and you look at how informed are their coaches about nutritional programming, about exercise science, uh, or, or even like things like base stats, are you using data-driven methods to uh, like, if you've seen the movie Moneyball, uh, oh, right. I love that movie. That's they go into how you can use data. Like for, for soccer, for example, you would think that if someone takes a penalty, then they have data on like every athlete. Who, uh, how many penalties do they score? What's the percentage of penalties that they get? Like, do they go left or right? The goalkeeper should also definitely be informed of those stats, you know, because at high level or many uh, players, they kick so fast that it's basically random yeah. choice. Like you just have to guess. You can't respond. So the, you, should, you would think the goalkeeper is always informed of those stats. No, like in many realms, they, they don't even use any of those stats. They don't, they're barely informed of exercise science, nutritional program design. The players, you often hear of them like binge drinking like at the Olympics using cocaine and those kind of things. And if you compare that to a bodybuilder who spends like even before they've, you know, the six months before the prep, everything they've done that. And then the six months prep of paying attention to their diet, the peak week, all of those things, you know, that's the level of dedication is so vastly uh, bigger for, for bodybuilding than for soccer, like on average, that, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Fast, efficient fat loss. Does that sound like music to your ears? The mini cut movement might just be for you. Mini cuts are like robbing the fat bank. You want to get in and out with as much fat as possible. In a short period of time, you could easily look to lose six to 12 pounds of fat. The mini cut movement is excellent. There's group support for extra accountability and also expert help within the group. We have educational videos to keep you on track along the way and you get all your nutrition and training customized and individualized for you. So if that sounds of interest, get involved with the mini cut movement and is actually out of interest is your work ethic genetically like determined as well somewhat genetically determined because i think a lot of people think of it as a separate thing to genetics but do you like are some people a, born to work question. hard yeah so there is actually quite some research that uh the drive to exercise also has a strong genetic component and that's a little bit more difficult to to measure in a person because it, you know it goes into what like what what is free will like because you can go to the gym like anyone you know you, you're physically capable like you can tell them right now and if they want to they can go to the gym but they sometimes they just don't want to mm. and that seems to also be genetically determined like if you look at heritability studies of twins and the like um, certain factors just there's a limit to what you can do and I've also found that as a PT I think every PT knows like there are some people you basically cannot help uh, or it's uh, it's a matter of time 
for most people, you can make a very big difference with three factors. That's fostering competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Those are the three factors that drive uh, intrinsic motivation and happiness, both. And they're, you know, in many ways, kind of the same construct. So if you, as a PT, I think that's part of my approach. You make them good at what they're doing. So they know, they know what to do. They know how to cut. They know how to diet. They know how to train. They have good exercise technique. They know how to make a meal plan, all of those things. Um, you make them related to what they're doing. So you need some kind of community or um, a relationship and they, they need to know that, uh, and this is often a problem for people that face social pressure because they feel that they are not related enough to the iron game or sports or bodybuilding or competing or, you know, they, they have a lot of other people in their life that don't understand them mm. and they don't know um, uh, why, why they have to be so different from everyone else. And you, you can get around that to a large extent if you have like a community or people that support you. Um, and CrossFit, for example, does this really well. You know, it's like, it's not uh, training to look good. It's functional training and you have uh, group classes. So you're not in it alone. And, you know, you, you call it CrossFit. It's like its own separate thing. And you all have the, the paleo diets, which is now, like, you know, a little bit more disentangled or keto. But you all have like the same kind of lifestyle community and, it's all about ancestral living and paleo and like functional training and those kind of things. So they, they're really good at creating relatedness. And that's mm -hmm. a big aspect I think, of CrossFit success. So it makes people motivated because it creates a bond with exercise and dieting. Um, and then the last one is autonomy. You need to make them autonomous. So this goes hand in hand, I think, with competence to a large extent for us because they, they need to be able to do it themselves. And that's also why, for example, in my coaching, I find that I don't check up much on clients unless I have reason to believe that they, um, they, they need to check up. Like, for example, their life is, I know their life is in like a really rough spot, for example, or I know there's something, um, yeah, you know, if you have some reason to believe that they need checking up, but otherwise it can actually work better. I find in many cases, if they, for example, don't check in for like two weeks and then they send you an email like, oh damn, I forgot to check up. Uh, this is what went wrong, for example. And then it comes from themselves and then it fosters intrinsic motivation much more because they, they learn from it. Whereas if you're like constantly checking up on them, um, I found it works for some people, but uh, for others, it's basically a band-aid because you, you don't make yeah. them autonomous. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess it's um, I, Atomic Habits. Uh, you probably, have you read that book? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I, I always think about like habits and how, well, for myself, and I'd probably say for you, Menno, you do a lot of stuff without thinking about it. And if someone was sure. to look from the outside in it, what you do every day, they're like, oh my God, like you are engineered for that mm -hmm. physique. Whereas we're just like, oh, I just do this out of like, just there's no, no kind of, um, no, we don't have to think about it. And yeah, kind of ingraining those habits and kind of having the community and everything. And I guess social media has been great in a sense for bodybuilding for that because there has been that kind of community building and kind of yeah, people can get definitely. into it. And even things like online forums and stuff. Yeah. And obviously we talked about the muscle building side, which I'm probably going to come back to. In terms of the fat loss side, kind of does that get impacted by genetics? I know you said like everyone can get lean. I know from observing at least bodybuilders, some people just get like those striated glutes and all through the rear. And it's just like, wow. Um, are there some people that just, I don't know, more people who get, I don't potentially more reward from food. And so they're just that mm -hmm. more food focused. You get those people who are just like, oh, I can give or take food. And then also, I guess, people who can diet on more kind of those spend thrift kind of metabolisms. Um, yeah, how much of that is, do you think that had, plays a role into things? Not, not nearly as much as muscle growth for, because basically everyone can get lean, but for some people it's harder. And for muscle growth, we have like four bodybuilders, we're like looking for the max. So, I mean, for body fat percentage as well, but the max is essential body fat level. So we know how to get to the max already. And for muscle growth, it's, you know, we, we always want to get bigger. Uh, and there's just a, a limit on how much muscle you can build naturally. So it varies in between individuals where that point is. And then, you know, you're, if you're there, then that's, that's the end of the road. But for, for fat loss, like, especially because most people don't need to be in the unsustainably low zone, uh, everyone can get like six pack lean pretty much. For some people, it's harder to maintain it as well, but everyone can get there. And it's also much easier because the two big factors that are like the biggest factors are 
your energy expenditure, so your basically your metabolic speed if you have fast metabolism, and your hunger level. And those things correlate. So that makes it not much of an issue because people that have a very high metabolic rate typically also have more hunger. And then it looks like, oh, they can diet on 3,000 calories. It must be so easy. But they are also hungrier than you are. So it's actually just as hard for them to be on 3,000 calories as it is for you potentially to be on 2,000 calories. I find that it, it does, especially with social eating events, 3,000 is a little easier because you just have a bigger buffer. Like if you eat a kilo of broccoli, like you have a lot of room to compensate for that. And if you eat a kilo of broccoli, you, you have to be on 1,200 calories. That's actually a big chunk of calories. So in practice, it, it makes a little bit of a difference, but overall, um, the big factor is that because those factors correlate, it's not nearly as uh, impactful. And things like just your base metabolic rate really doesn't mean much in terms of how easy it is to, to get lean. And then there's things like food rewards. It doesn't differ that much predictably between like, for example, obese and non-obese individuals. Um, appetite. Um, yeah, like I said, it, it correlates with metabolic rates. Then there's metabolic adaptivity, but this goes both ways. So some people have a big gap, and I always use myself as an example, like I'm very metabolically adaptive. I'm now bulking on uh, 3,100 calories. And if I have to get contest lean, I have to go to 1,800. 1,900 does not cut it. I plateau 100%. And like uh, 86 kilograms, 185 meters, I plateau on 1,900 calories. With uh, cardio and strength training. Cardio at that point actually does nothing for me. It's like pure, pure compensatory energy expenditure for me. So uh, I, I like 100% plateau and I need to go down to the, the 1800 level, which kind of sucks, statistically yeah. speaking, you know? Uh, and I have a huge, huge appetite. But uh, it also is quite easy for me, relatively speaking, to maintain because I, as soon as I start eating more, my metabolism ramps up really fast. And I can go like when I'm bulking out to 3100 and maintain there, uh, still have abs and like genuinely lean bulk without putting on basically no fat, like very, very, lean, not measurable most weeks. So that, it's like that for most people. And a lot of people that find that they have to get so low in energy intake, they can actually ramp up really high afterwards to, to maintain that level. So it sucks to get there, but once you're there, it's easier for them, for other people to maintain it. So because these factors are, they go both ways, uh, with fat loss, it's, I'd say that it decisively less influenced yeah. by genetics. And because everyone can get lean, just energy balance, thermodynamics apply to everyone. And there's no such thing where the body just says like, nothing happens anymore. All the body says is energy expenditure decreases, appetite increases, and food cravings increase. But if you can, you can do something about all of those factors. So everyone can get lean, some people just have a bit harder time than others. I think that's really well said. It's basically, essentially, it's all relative uh, for everyone involved. And uh, I'm very similar. I kind of massing right now on 4,000 calories and I have to mm -hmm. cut down below, always down to like the low 2000s to get any kind of leanness, yeah. which is frustrating. But at the end of the day, like everyone's like, it's relative. So you can't really complain about it too much. Yeah. I guess the good thing is maintaining on higher calories. And then you talk, spoke about it. And I think nutrition is just so much more impacted by environment than anything else Definitely. in social life and those sort of things. So I think a lot of people think maybe they have a hard time, but and it may be genetic, but then actually it's all the things outside which have a huge impact on nutrition. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one of the things actually I thought was interesting was some people talk about when you start makes a difference. So if you start when you're like, you know, as a male, 15, 16 years old, just as you're getting into the gym, like you have your natural steroid cycle because mm. you're like, all well, the hormones are at their highest. Do you think that has a difference? Like if you started when you're 16 versus like 20, 25, 30, do you think that's gonna kind of impact where you can get to and like, yeah, essentially where you're gonna get to? Um, I think for muscle growth uh, and fat loss, no. For strength loss, a little, and for sports, definitely, yes. So there's there's very little research to support a link in general between age of starting, um, <clears throat> other than in some sports. Uh, in sports, it's different for two reasons. One, there are some sports uh, where you just need an absolutely insane amount of, uh, of practice. Like uh, if you want to be a competitive chess player, for example, <laughs> it's uh, insane that like, things where the 10,000 hour wow. rule come from. And it's like competitive uh, chess, uh, playing the violin, and some of those things are also predetermined by, uh, they're very age, age sensitive. 
Olympic weightlifting is also relatively age sensitive because it's very technical. And injuries can be devastating. Like if you, you're injured, your motor coordination is slightly impaired, that may be at the elite level, you know, you're like 1% slower, that's, that's it. You know, if you, have to, if you run the 100 meters uh, one second slower, uh, that, that's huge. That's like at the elite level, that's absolutely huge. And you're completely, you're completely done. So because the, the amount of practice involved and the fact that motor coordination, um, it generally thinks that just like riding a bicycle is um, when the brain is still developing, it's more susceptible or um, more primed in a better state basically to take up something new and mm -hmm. respond to that for later on. It's like learning a language or learning to ride a bicycle. If you did it early in life, you have a, a pretty big advantage compared to if you try to do it later. Language is, is an extreme example because there are actually parts of the brain that are uh, seemingly uh, genetically wired to, to learn language at a certain time. And after that time, the, those sort of close, like growth plates, if you will, like very simplified analogy, but um, it, that's why it's so difficult to learn a new language after like age 21. And when you've already learned a language in particular. Um, but strength training has, has some of that, at least in terms of so how the body learns to coordinate your muscles, like motor coordination. Mm -hmm. So, but for muscle growth, uh, I'm not aware of any research actually showing a link. You, know? uh, you hear that a lot, like he started really young. Yeah. Uh, that, that's why he's so jacked. It's like, you also have like old man strength and everything. And I think time is the only factor. Like you have an advantage if you start early because you've been lifting longer and you have an advantage if you're older because you've been lifting longer. But other than that, there I don't think there's anything to like uh, to to those phenomena. I think that's probably a nice thing for hopefully. I mean, it's not if you started early, great, you started early. But if you're listening and you've started later, then don't use it as an excuse not to kind of push yeah. your limits. And I guess that brings in another question. I know um, I was reading kind of Brad Schoenfeld's most late, latest book. Um, I think it's the scientific development of muscle hypertrophy mm -hmm. i might get that wrong uh, but i think he he spoke in there about kind of genetic limits and he said like he doesn't not i'm not sure he would say as far as he doesn't believe in it but he's just like he's not convinced that anyone really ever gets there and potentially just your age caps you what's mm -hmm. been your experience with that man how have you seen that kind of in practice well he's right in the sense that there is no hard evidence that we have a, a natty max uh it's it's mostly observational and of course you never know like uh, like we talked about, like maybe they would still respond to something different. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, anecdotally, if you look at like world records, how, how they plateau over time, uh, muscle mass, like fat free mass index, uh, the famous paper of the 25 fat free mass index, um, you know, you see that there are some outliers, but it's not like it, it, it's anywhere consistent. So, yeah, for most people, it's going to be really hard to go over 25 fat free mass index. And at some point, you also get into the, um, to the point where mathematically maybe it's asymptotic, it's not like a hard limit, but you're talking about a rate of progression that's so slow that you might as well talk about like a hard limit. You know, you're talking about, and I measured it at some point, uh, it was like a pound over a year, uh, like same stats, calipers, everything controlled in perfect energy balance, and again, like a pound in a year of doing everything right. Uh, and I'm probably, <laughs> uh, you know, on the other hand, if I could keep gaining that, for you know another 10 years that would be great but it's probably going to be even less every year right. so uh yeah is there a hard limit maybe, maybe not but in practice yeah if you like the calculator on my website uh, i don't know anyone who's surpassed that level that's like if you if you, if you even get there it's like awesome <laughs> yeah, actually bringing it back to that calculator i did do it before we came on air and i think my natural my max natural kind of body weight at five percent was 195.5 pounds and i was like i got big wrists and ankles i was like mm -hmm. god damn if i ever get to that i am gonna be like yeah. absolutely <laughs> like fabergasted but i think my and it said my normalized ffmi right now was like 23.7 which is mm -hmm. according to like your guide mine, yeah. pretty decent like um yeah you're saying like 24.9 was upper limit for people's like genetics generally for most people which is obviously mm -hmm. right by that 25 I guess some people kind of look at that FFMI and they look at people and they kind of, kind of, you know, it's like the natty witch hunt and they try and call them out. Is there kind of, what are your thoughts behind that? Um, how would you, like, if you were going to give people advice on that sort of thing, what would you say? It's probabilistic. That, that's the main thing. So I formulated it very precisely in the calculator. Like 
is the percentage chance, because you can also use it to see if someone is, or the percentage chance that someone, a random person out picked out of the population would achieve that level of muscle mass. And with some people, it's like 1%, uh, and some people it's like 5%. And you know, the 5%er, um, um, good example would be like Jeff Nippert. Yeah. Is, is Jeff Natty? I, I don't know for sure. Like Nobody but Jeff really knows for sure, probably. So um, we have good indications to think he has great genetics. Like, he also runs in the family. Uh, I would say, like, based on him talking to him, but I've seen like his physique, he, he does not have a juicer physique at all. Like, and his, his progression, everything, it doesn't say uh, juicer to me. Uh, he also doesn't seem like the type, but that's a weak argument because you'd be surprised yeah. uh, when you've been in the industry a while. But, you know, we'll, ne we'll never know. So yeah, for statistically, he's he's out there in terms of genetics, and we we can say that either he has good genetics or he's on the juice, like. But we don't. We, you'll never know. So that's the thing. Like you, you can make you can say that about someone, but other than that, yeah, it's just probabilistic. And you you'll get if you just test enough people, you'll get someone that's like the super outlier. You know, you we have those people from the the nineteen forties that kind of area. But like fat free mass index of maybe you know, uh, even corrected for caliper measurements, it would still be like 27. I think the, uh, there was one 29, uh, but like several 26 plus around 27, which is like crazy muscular, you know? So yeah, they exist. And it's, it's in many of those cases, it was exceedingly improbable that they were on drugs, like basically almost physically impossible. Like they, they would have to be like, Ahead of, ahead of the game, injecting that stuff will, yeah, it was, uh, that's a very, very far stretch case. So, you know, when you're talking about a logarithmic curve, like, yeah, 95% of people are going to be like in this same zone. There's going to be like some guy or, or gal that's like way the hell out there. And it's like a complete genetic miracle. And nobody will ever believe that person's natty, but they actually are. And I think to that point, I think because people, I think people think there's more of that type of person than there is because when you look at like the way we digest information, it's all social media. So people with yeah. average physiques, they don't, you don't see as many people like that because you're sure. not going to follow them. They don't get the big followings. Whereas you see these guys who have amazing physiques and they are saying they're natural. Maybe they compete in natural feds and you're kind of like, uh, like that seems like, and it's to them, it seems like there's a lot of them, but in reality, it's just, they have a lot of followers and they get a lot of viewership. But in, in fact, if we were to, if everyone had that many followers and we we're following everyone within bodybuilding, you'd be like, oh, okay, like now I, I have a better average picture of what to expect. Yeah, for sure. Like it's, it's, it's very skewed depending on which population you ask. Because there's, there's also like sort of the nihilist cultures or like anyone that looks remotely like they lift in a t-shirt is like, ah, for sure I'm here, you know? And then there's the people that are just completely clueless and they're like, is this funny Coleman guy really natty, you know? So yeah, completely depends on your frame of reference. Yeah, absolutely. And no, I think in, I think that kind of, I don't know, the way I look at it, I always like give the benefit of the doubt. So like Jeff, if I look at him, maybe I'm like, oh yeah, he looks like he could be either very genetically well endowed or on gear. He says he's not like, <laughs> I just leave it like that. There's no point, yeah, like it's a waste of time anymore. Like, cause most people, it's like when you, you got a test result at school and you're like, how did you do? It, it, you're not actually asking how that person did. You want to know how you did in comparison, yeah. you know? So with, with, with Natty Max, that's the main thing. And I think that's why the calculator, you know, you, you can use it as a, a rough frame of reference or what would be like a, a very good target. But other than that, all you know is, can, can you progress? And if you're not progressing, like what do you need to do to uh, still make progress? And what's your actual Natty Max going to be? That There's only one way to find out. And on this regard like for people who potentially they're the kind of slow burners or they're people who maybe aren't as genetically well endowed i've just seen i, I think i may have even pulled this up from one of uh, mike israel's videos where someone said you overcomplicate things use science and still look like shit uh, i don't think it was towards mike i can't remember who it was too you still look like shit stop yeah. thinking and just train hard such and such looks better than you that was kind of like a, a random statement that someone might make and do you think that's just i mean how helpful is that like those sort of comments? I mean, because it's, and I think of like the survivorship bias or something. These are the people that despite what they do almost, they're going to get results and then they just think everyone else is overthinking it. Like what, what are your thoughts on statements like that? 
Yeah, I think if you look at, and, and in general, if anyone looks at Mike uh, and they're like, uh, if they're either even like, <laughs> are you natty? Or if they're like, uh, I'm not um, impressed by your physique, then they're just clueless. Yeah. Mike has objectively pro bodybuilder level stats. Like his, his Fafi Masenex is insane. <laughs> like he is jacked off the charts, okay? It's like, it's not a matter of debate. You may not like how he looks, but he's, he's fucking jacked. So um, that, that's, you, you can already tell like what someone's, um, pr you know, frame of reference is and how data grounded they are. Uh, and in general, I think for a lot of people, it's also one of those things like they just try to uh, play off someone's expertise or something because that, that's all they're saying. Like, well, you, you look poor. So it's like, it's, even if someone does, like it doesn't have to mean anything, you know, I think for fat loss, um, I would definitely trust someone, especially when it comes to diet adherence and the like, someone who's gotten really lean, but especially for muscle growth, because we know there's big genetic variability. Some people are more like armchair experts and that can actually still be people you learn a lot from. But you may want to mix that with some practical advice. You know, it doesn't mean that they're wrong about what they're saying. Um, so, you know, at best, um, like factually, it doesn't mean anything. Like it's a complete logical fallacy. You know, but it does have some use in the sense that because some people say it doesn't mean anything. And of course, that's logically speaking 100% true. But people need to filter information based on limited cues because they are not going to do all the research themselves. And they look at some cues. And then I'd say if someone is jacked, it means something, um, especially if they're like natty jacked. Um, but it's, it's, it's a small cue. And it's things like exercise technique. Um, if someone's been injured and had a certain injury, that's an actual indication they may have something to say about, you know, how to rehab that injury, like what they did, how they got over it. If someone's jacked and how they got jacked, doesn't mean so much. If someone's ripped, especially if they were fat before, that, that is actually somewhat informative. So, but all of this is like here in the hierarchy compared to is does what they're saying actually make sense? Can they support it with evidence? You know, that, that is by far the biggest thing. Hey, Pascal here. I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. And I guess, yeah, some people talk about, I don't know, don't ask the guy who's always had know, big arms or big legs how they got big legs because they haven't really had to try for it. Ask the guy who's had like a hard time getting them big. Um, so is that similar, like if for someone who's always been like on the smaller side and they've just over time managed to get this impressive physique, do you feel like that is someone for the listeners if they were looking someone for information and they were kind of, I don't know, struggling to decipher whether or not it was kind of good information? Is that like a, a general advisable thing to do? That's, that's definitely much better than just looking at who's big. Yeah. For example, if you look at like calf training, that's always like the funny thing when you look at people like, oh, bro, how did you get the calf so big? And they're like, I don't actually train calf, bro. It's like, okay, so that must be the winning recipe, you know, don't train calves. Uh, so yeah, if you look at people who got small calves and then made them into big calves, then you have a lot more information and guaranteed they're not going to tell you they don't train them. So yeah, you're, you're a bit closer, but it's still, it's one person. Yeah. You don't know if they're natty. You don't know if what they were doing made no sense at all before. And most people have a very hard time distinguishing which factors made a difference because over time we typically yeah. improve our diet, our lifestyle and our training all together gradually and it's very hard to measure muscle growth you know like over time um i see like i like i feel my arms are a little bit bigger since last year or so but i you know there are a lot of things different uh including the pandemic for example you know so the training was very different this year a lot of things were different so you know was there like the one magic exercise that made the difference probably not yeah so in the end, I think science has a, is, is very, very high for me on the hierarchy of science and data when it comes to does something make sense? And the other factors are more like discerning, like a rough discerning of who to, who to listen to. But if someone publishes scientific and data-based or, or data-driven articles uh, or podcasts, videos, that's like by far one of the biggest things. Because then you can also see for yourself, does what they're seeing make sense? Do they have evidence to support it? You can check what you know, uh, you can check it yourself. Um, and I can say from personal experience, it, it's also much harder to, to write like an article or make a video and 
have it be supported with scientific references because if you you can just say something and you might not even be aware that it's just something you've said so many times that you, you thought it's true or you know everyone says it's true mm -hmm. um but then when you actually start looking at research like I've, I've had some cases where i'm like i know this is true like do i really have to look up a reference and then i start digging and i'm like so actually the support for this is not as as firm as i thought you know and then you you're really forced to um to question all your own beliefs and that's the way forward to finding yeah. real truth i think that's fantastic and i guess one thing people might argue back at you benno and they'd be like i don't know science they don't test the huge guys like you don't get like mm -hmm. the, the the populations and the, the studies are only a certain length and kind of what would be your general kind of take on people saying that if you like is it just a case of like i understand that but it's still the best we have right now right so i think it, it really helps to look um from the from anecdote to science rather than from science down because if you look at like a scientific study you can say like the duration is not so long like oh sample size was only 20 people you know they used bioelectrical impedance rather than mri to measure muscle mass so i'm like screw that study because that's what a lot of people do you know they look for reasons to discredit the whole study rather than you know weigh it because yeah. you can weigh a study's evidence based on its methodological uh, quality but there, there's almost never a reason to completely discredit a study like it has to be like a serious in impairment of its especially internal validity like for example if you find low carb was better for fat loss or muscle growth but protein intake was higher that's like that's a groundbreaking um limitation on your ability to say was it really the carbs or was it the protein but other than that like limitations are, are not reasons to completely discredit a study and if you look from anecdotes to science you can see for example okay so we have this guy and he's been doing this and this worked better now we get this guy and we get 19 other guys that are going to do this program like this his, his type of calf training for example and we're going to contrast it with another 20 people that do a different kind of calf training. Not only that, but we're going to measure uh, how much muscle they're gaining of all of them on average. We're making sure they're gonna be on the same program. We're also gonna control their diets. And, you know, more, 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 more. And we're not just gonna measure like their word for how much bigger they get. We're actually gonna measure muscle mass, even if it's worth a circumference state. And then if you look at all those factors, then you can start to see, well, oh, this, this evidence is starting to get really, really strong. And even if you have some limitations, like they're only, they only measure that for two months, you can see just how much more evidence even a, a single study provides compared to what some guy says. It's, it's a completely different ball game in terms of evidence. Like science is not something like, the, the funny thing is when people talk, what about real life? Like, science is real life. You know, that these people actually exist. You know, <laughs> these, a lot of studies are done on like athletes and trainees that they're actual people. They actually did that program. You know, this, this happens on this planet, you know, in the times we live in. So there, there is no, it's not like a theoretical model, like a computer simulation or something, you know? Um, the science is real life. Fantastic. And actually, I meant to ask when you brought up um, kind of talking about, you talked about actually the fact that you can use these measurements on females as well. Does your calculator work? I can't remember if it, is there a female specific one or is it yeah. the same measurements? I, I use differences? the available data for uh, female maximum muscular potential. Uh, and I, I cannot break it down to uh, per muscle sites because there's not enough data. But like total body fat free mass, uh, it may be a little conservative. I've had quite some women contact me and say, like, ah, oh, I'm basically there. Uh, and I'm like, well, you know, you're, you're like five time CrossFit champion. So it <laughs> makes sense uh, to me, actually. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've not had anyone that's like over it. And a lot, a lot of people in general are like, oh, I'm pretty much there. And like, yeah, but you're not. 10% body fat, like that's what you input, but that's not reality. So um, it's, it's a bit more limited, but I think uh, it's, it's the best we have currently. And it's, it's still a reasonable indication. And with your calculator, have you had, I don't know how many people you've taken through it and like, I don't know, how likely do you think most people are to get to that point? I don't know if that's even a question I can really ask you or is it tricky? Yeah, you, you can use the, um, the, the percentage one like that says like what's the percentage chance and like do it with your own stats you get some idea um but in general i'd say that if you even get to that level that's like what you get with good genetics yeah uh and it's it's theoretically possible to exceed it but then you're like the the one in a million you know so it's basically that's the level you could get at if you have good genetics and i guess you're doing everything 
outside yeah pretty much spot yeah. bang on perfect <laughs> pretty much yeah i was looking at it i was thinking wow if i could be 195 pounds on stage that's like another uh well it's a heck of a lot more than i weigh on stage <laughs> currently so i was like ah. yeah it's a good it's nice though because it's it's an aim and in that regard uh if people are kind of training and they are maybe getting results but they're like hmm, could i be getting more am i a slow burner or am i just not maximizing things are there any things you could people could generally look at to know if i don't know they should be doing more um to get more out of their training uh, maybe less even yeah that's difficult um because because the correlation between like someone's 90 max and how fast they can gain muscle does not appear to be linear remotely uh, in fact we uh we did a pretty exhaustive review recently I'm not sure if we're going to publish it uh probably um and we found that Someone's baseline muscle mass is not a good indicator of how much muscle they can gain or how fast they gain muscle. Like not at all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like anecdotally, I think like there has to be some correlation, but based on the research, it's like really poor. So you can have someone that starts off really small and they actually gain muscle really fast, and you can have someone that starts off really big and they, they actually seem to um, make relatively slow amount of gains. So. The rate, saying something about the rate of muscle growth is really difficult. And I guess that comes into a lot of people talk about, I don't know, you make the most of your gains in the first five years or what have you. I think that probably comes with a lot of assumptions. And I think people, I mean, as you train, assess, especially for myself, like I've just, I've learned more, I've learned myself more. Mm -hmm. So my rate of growth has actually almost like stayed the same or even sped up at times when it should have mm -hmm. like on paper slowed down do you see that the case like i don't know probably you take on a client and you're like they've said they've plateaued and then you're like yeah, oh, with, we can with make new these clients changes. a lot but then of course you change so many things at once yeah then uh it makes sense but for many people uh mm -hmm. especially people that are on their own that don't have a coach it's, it's very stepwise as well like and i've had um periods of years where i didn't really make any progress so i've been i've been lifting for um, about 17 years now, um, in, in some form, like uh, about 15 years, like in gyms, and um, it probably the amount of actual time progressing of that, like making good consistent progress, uh, barring the last, which is like the, the one pound per year kind of rates. I probably say that the first 10 years, I, I made probably three years of like actual progress, and seven years learning how to make further progress. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important because I think uh, like people hear the figures and then they kind of feel like they want to give up. And in fact, this is the time when like just learn a little bit more because, um, I mean, there's some big things that you can get right every day that are going to, I mean, they're, they're relatively, mm -hmm. uh, I would say simple things to get right that are going to have a big, big impact. And it isn't the people look towards supplementation and things. And I think for a lot of people, and I mean, it comes back to that slow burn type of people who are, who are just gaining their genetic limit is just they're slowly going to get there over many years it's that consistency element and continually like small adjustments and making sure that you're every day kind of focusing on that process yeah definitely like a lot of things also make it much more sustainable like you learn things of how to manage appetite so just a new recipe for example like it doesn't really contribute to your gains uh, acutely at all because you're at the same energy intake but the fact that you are now doing so much more sustainably makes a huge impact on like how yeah. easy it is to maintain that body fat level you reach over the next decade, for example. Fantastic. Menno, I think we've actually covered everything I wanted to about genetics and kind okay. of for muscle growth. And I really hope this can act as a resource. If people have questions about it, um, they can look here and get kind of the lowdown because I think yeah some people look at genetics and they use it as a cop-out card or they're like oh no ignore genetics it's all about hard work whereas i think it's fairly more complex than that and uh, i really want to thank you for taking the time to yeah, explain everything and if people want to learn more about you uh where should they head and i'll make sure obviously um that calculator that you we've talked about quite a lot is going to be linked below and mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure if, if people are getting high scores in there, I want to hear about it. So get, put them in the comments or, yeah, email, sure, yeah. I guess let Menno know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Um, MennoAnsmalls.com uh, is where you'll find all my stuff. Uh, if you're new to my contents, probably the best way to get to know me is like on my main, uh, like on the main page. Uh, I have an email newsletter and you get a lot of free content, like a free email course, basically. It's like my most popular articles that people like that have been following me for a lot longer. Uh, and then you can see uh, if it's something you're liking. Awesome. Thank you so much, Menno, and thank you everyone for listening. Good talk. Take care.
So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Your Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.